When I first met Rachel, she described transitioning as a woman and being very happy with her physical appearance until she opened her mouth. And then what people heard was the voice of a man. So she learned to be quiet. That was easy enough in supermarkets. She just pointed to what she wanted. She greeted people with a smile. Sometimes she'd whisper and tell people she'd lost her voice. When I first met Sally, she'd transitioned successfully several years previously. She described growing up as Simon and being bullied from the age of 11 through to 16 because as Simon, the other boys at school said his voice was too girly. And so Simon learned not to talk in school. Now when I met Sally, she was very happily living as a woman. But she'd brought with her a deep-seated lack of self-confidence and lack of self-esteem in her voice. And so she was still having problems talking in a group. These women's experiences are not unusual. For biological females transitioning into males, changing voice is less of a challenge because taking testosterone automatically deepens the voice. For biological males transitioning to females, it's a much more complex and challenging journey. Not only because learning voice techniques, learning to adapt the voice, is really hard work. It requires effort, patience, step-by-step, -step, daily exercise. But also because we live in this Western society in quite a rigid binary gender system. And what that means is we have stereotypes and assumptions about what's a man, what's a woman a man in a woman's body, a woman in a man's body. And sometimes clients arrive to work with me with those stereotypes. They bring them with them, and they have quite a fixed idea of what constitutes a feminine voice. Now, thankfully, we're at a time of rapid change, and you probably know that from all the stories in the media. We've had people charting their transgender journey, We've had other celebrities who are busting the myth of physical appearance and mixing up male and female visual appearances. And we've had programs like Louis Theroux's Transgender Kids, which is fantastic for helping us move towards a more fluid description of gender. And with that fluid description of gender comes a much freer, richer variety of expression within voice, language, nonverbal behavior. But the women I work with generally don't want to put themselves out in the media. They want to stay fairly quiet, understated, and get on with their lives, and learn to have a voice that authentically is who they are. They want to be themselves, be true to themselves. And the really hard thing about that is because voice is so intricately linked with our identity and emotion. We share emotion through voice. You know, the voice of reason, we spoke with one voice, I voiced my concerns. Those sayings are there for a reason because we transmit so much through voice and, and all the other nonverbal signals that are going on all the time. So for these women, there's, there's an issue around the vulnerability that that brings. They're not only trying to learn voice techniques, but they're managing that fear of people finding them out, of, of being vulnerable. So let's have a look at this little instrument. There it is. Don't go, ugh, that's part of your body. Love it. And that, you know, that really is interesting because, you know, the first step to actually learning to change voice, to modify voice, is, is to learn to love it, to love the voice you have, and to learn to become aware and notice what it is doing because so much happens at a subconscious level. Now the little V-shape, the two little white glistening bits in the middle there are your vocal folds. You might know them as vocal cords. They're medically called vocal folds, so I'm going to use that term. So just pop two fingers on one side of your Adam's apple and thumb on the other. Just very, very light touch and just hum for me. Okay, easy enough to feel the vibration. So you've got breath coming out and those two little fellas are vibrating together there as the air comes through. So you've got a camera view down into the larynx here. They vibrate together and off you go with a nice voice. Now I want you to imagine you're going to cough 
but I want you to stop just before you cough, okay? So I want you to go, and don't actually cough. There's a lot of coughing going on for an instruction that said don't actually cough. What do you notice just before you cough? Feels like they're closing, because they are. And the reason is that these little fellas are not primarily for voice at all. Their primary function is protection, protecting the airway. And that's what you've just experienced. They come together very well. They close very effectively, partly to protect the airway if you were actually coughing to expel some debris. They also come together as part of that fight or flight mechanism to protect us when we feel vulnerable, when we feel frightened, when we feel threatened. So the task when working with voice is, is to help people understand that and to learn to be vulnerable and still keep the voice free rather than it tightening and closing altogether. So what about pitch? Well, the women I work with, as I say, can come with quite a stereotyped view of where their voices should be. They want to sound very feminine. And there are lots of apps and computer programs so we can show people their pitch visually, what it looks like in terms of a, a visual trace. So the top line for the average female, pitch is around somewhere between 200 and 220 hertz. It's measured in something called hertz, if, if you don't know. So the younger female members here, your voices are probably 200, if not slightly above, whereas mine is actually 200. I've got a reasonably deep voice uh, for a woman. Those of you who are male speakers in the audience, then your pitch will be down around 120, possibly up to 140-ish. Uh, so, so that's the lower line. And we've got this whole area in the middle, which is round about 150 to 180, which is somewhere between male and female. There's a whole overlap between male voices and female voices. And what was the number at the beginning that's the title of my talk? 165. So 165, if I was to do a voice at 165, it would be uh, 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 somewhere around there. Uh. If you were just to hear that, a voice on that pitch, then the chances are you wouldn't be able to accurately say whether it was male or female. So we have kind of gender neutral pitches. And what we do in communication is we then start to read other signals around uh, resonance and uh, pause, and then where somebody's voice moves, because of course we don't just stay on one pitch like this line when we're talking as I'm doing now, I'm moving my pitch around to do some words that are fairly high if I want to emphasize a word up here, and then I might bring my voice back down and it drops right down almost to a male pitch if I want it to. Now for me, that's fine. I still know I've got a woman's voice. For clients who are learning to adapt voice, it can be really, really uncomfortable to move away from pitch, start to go higher and then not know what's going to happen or actually even start to come down and be worried that their voice is going to stay back down. Now, because we're in this time of change, the really exciting thing is that the younger we're working with clients, the more we're seeing clients who actually don't want to move their voice from male to female or even from female to male. They want to actually have this voice which is gender neutral and they may even identify as non-binary uh, and stay within that androgyny for appearance, voice and, and, uh, and their whole being. And that's great. For my clients, however, mostly they want to feminize their voice. And the issue is around that vulnerability that there, there's a fantastic TED talk which I'm sure a, a lot of you have seen by Brené Brown who talks about vulnerability and one of the things she says is that we need to bust the myth of vulner being vulnerable being weak and negative you know I'm vulnerable standing here of course I am I'm talking in front of a whole room full of people what I need to do is acknowledge that vulnerability and work with it. So if I'm actually acknowledging that I feel vulnerable and running with that emotion and still managing voice, body, language, all the things that actually stay connected with you as an audience, 
then that gives me the courage and builds what we call self-efficacy, which is not just the knowledge about what next little action will help me, but it's that self-belief behind the action. So that's where I'm trying to get my clients to, not just to kind of learn a new pitch and move their voices to something which they think is more feminine, but to work with that vulnerability that says, you know, step into that place of being who you are at this moment in time. And that actually says something about their courage. So what I did, I, you know, I was working individually with lots of clients and thinking, you know, the vulnerability is, is stopping clients from taking what they learn in the clinic with me individually, doing practice exercises at home, and transferring that into real life situations, talking with people in shops, pubs, cafes, on the phone. You know, those situations are full of emotion, emotional content. And the fear of being vulnerable for clients quite often stops them then from being able to, to adapt voice in those settings. The vulnerability is on two counts. One, because they're frightened, they can't actually do this new voice that they've practiced. And the second thing is, what will other people think of them? Will they see the fear? Will they ridicule them? Will they not pass? So just a little exercise for you around pitch. So you, you can find your pitch by doing just aha, uh -huh, just do aha, uh aha. -huh, uh -huh. uh -huh. So that's the kind of pitch at which your voice works best without any effort. It's your kind of voice with its PJs on, its cashmere socks, sitting on a sofa, you know, hey, I can do that, aha, uh -huh. no effort. Now let's imagine I'm trying to get you to raise your pitch so take it up just a couple of notches. So I'll show you what I want you to do. I want you to go, uh-huh, find that uh-huh, and then uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Just find something which is a couple of notes higher, not very much higher. And I want you to turn to your neighbor and talk for 10 seconds in that slightly higher new voice. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Hello. Uh -huh. I think I'm, I'm coming out on the microphone. Um, yes, so am I. It seems really odd. It seems slightly... Okay, how is that? Easy, hard? Hard. Did it feel like you, not you? Did it require effort? So if I'd carried on letting you talk, in the end you'd have gone, oh, stuff that, I'm going back to my PJ voice. <laughs> and you wouldn't have carried on because it's not sustainable without a lot of hard work and practice. And immediately, you know, it doesn't, it's this thing that it doesn't feel like me. It feels fake. So my, my passion for my clients is to work with with the real them and the voice they have in the moment, as well as helping them to get a little more along the journey of where they want to be. And that means not looking too far into the future, exploring voice in the here and now, finding out what it does, being curious. So one of the first steps is about, is about exploring voice, freeing it up and noticing what happens. Now this picture is my lovely friend Colin, who. Uh, what I decided to do as a way of trying to bridge this work was, um, was bring in singing. And the reason I did that is because with my own voice, I know that working through singing has undoubtedly helped my speaking voice as well. You know, it's all this continuum and this great spectrum of learning to work this instrument for a particular purpose in a particular situation. There's a lot of stuff, you know, around singing for the brain, singing and well-being, it releases endorphins, you know, fun group activity. So there's lots of evidence that singing together is, is very healthy. And it's a very present activity. You know, we're in the here and now, connecting with other people and connecting with our emotions very often in, in song. So I called on Colin, who's a fantastic choir director. We use the same voice techniques and um, he's also very inspiring and inclusive. He believes that everybody can sing. So I wanted him to be part of this TED talk. And we set up this eight-week group. We managed to get some funding from the NHS, from my university. And over this eight weeks, we had a group of 10 transgender women, plus four speech and language therapy students who were learning to use voice techniques. And, uh, and, and we brought them in as part of the project. Um, and we did a mixture. It wasn't just a choir. We did some voice exercises. We did some theory. We did songs. We did discussion, problem solving. Uh, and then taking all that into spoken voice and what it meant for these 
women to be then taking more knowledge and skills in voice out into these everyday situations in which they feel, feel quite often so vulnerable uh, and feel that they can't actually uh, use the techniques they've practiced. And what's really been encouraging is that over the eight weeks, there was not just a sense of these women learning about their voices, learning more skills, but that real sense of self-efficacy was what was noticeable. And that was on a number of counts, really. It was uh, partly to do with the, the camaraderie of the group. Um, but there were some very interesting comments from the clients at the end. And, and one of the things they said was, um, you know, working with the students in the group has been fantastic because we realized the students felt vulnerable and afraid uh, and made mistakes with their voices. And so it, it wasn't just us, it was everybody. And it broke down the barriers and there was no us and them. We were just all individuals working with our voices. And for me, sing, the singing part of it is, is this present activity. You know, as I'm talking to you now, I have to be really present in what I'm doing to manage everything, to manage my internal emotional state, to manage some of these behaviors outwardly that are trying to connect with you, to manage things like the, the PowerPoint and having a drink of water if my voice gets dry. I have to have the confidence to just be able to take a pause and take a drink to keep my voice healthy. And singing is that kind of present activity. It, it's about that, that give and take. I'm not going to talk about first and third circle because that's a whole other TED talk and, uh, and I haven't really got time. But if you want to know about first, second, third circle and how present sits in that second circle, then I urge you to go to Patsy Rodenberg's YouTube clip on presence. She talks about second circle being a place of presence where there's that give and take. And John Kabat-Zinn, who's the father of mindfulness, talks about presence being really important because the present moment is the only moment we have. And for some of the transgender clients, you know, a lot of their focus has either been on these, these quite significant negative events from the past, or it can be on the worry about, are they ever gonna get there in the future? Are they ever gonna have this voice that is congruent with who they really are? And so keeping them present focused on the voice they have in this moment in time and how they can learn about it and work with it and still be the authentic self uh, at that point in time uh, you know, is, a, is a real challenge. And, it, and it's great that actually what the group did um, was encourage them to stay present and authentic with who they, who they really were. So the whole kind of group thing was, uh, you know, like a glass half full. That, that there, were, there was a real sense of positivity, even around challenge. So things that they found challenging were still positive rather than being these insurmountable, insurmountable barriers. And I just want to come back finally to um, Renee Brown again. She said, vulnerability is about showing up and letting yourself be seen. And for me, that, that was a huge part of the client's journey and is still a huge part of their onward journey because I'm carrying on working in, in with this kind of client group and, it, and it's a very exciting um, time to be working with them. You know, their comments were about um, voice, ref you know, I feel now I've been working on voice, that it reflects more of the real me. And at the end of this particular eight-week project, um, we not only got them to show up and be seen, but we also got them to be heard. And we invited people along, and they did a little performance. And that, again, was a real way of getting them to accept being vulnerable and stepping into that place of challenge and having the courage uh, and so I'd like to invite them into this TED Talk. So here's my bunch of courageous transgender women without whom this TED Talk wouldn't have happened. Oh.